Hi hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on limits involving infinity. We found out that vertical asymptotes are related to infinite limits, where the y values are approaching infinity or negative infinity. And we also talked about finding horizontal asymptotes and how they relate with limits at infinity, where x is approaching infinity or x is approaching negative infinity. In this video, we're going to talk about how to find horizontal asymptotes using an algebraic approach. So now that we know how to evaluate limits involving infinity, both graphically and numerically, and we also have ways of locating vertical and horizontal asymptotes, we're going to turn our attention now to an algebraic approach for finding horizontal asymptotes. In most situations, the answers on operations involving infinity can be given in intuitive ways. What that means is that you can think of infinity as a very large number when you're doing operations, or you can think of negative infinity as a very large negative number. So suppose that A is a positive real number. Here are some operations that you can think of intuitively involving infinity. If you take infinity and add infinity, well, infinity is not a number, but you can think of infinity as a large number. You take a large number plus another large number, you do get another large number. So infinity plus infinity will give you infinity. Infinity plus a positive number, well, A is just a real number, but infinity is very large. So infinity plus A will just be another large number, so infinity. Same thing, a plus infinity is infinity. If you take a very large number and subtract a real number, it's still a very large number. So infinity subtract a is infinity. Negative infinity plus a is negative infinity. So a very large negative number plus a real number is still a really large negative number. And negative infinity subtract a real number, a, is still a very large negative number, so negative infinity. Infinity times infinity is a very large number, so infinity. A real number that is positive, times infinity is a very large number, so infinity. Infinity times a is infinity. Negative infinity times negative infinity is positive infinity, so a very large negative number times a very large negative number will give you a positive large number. Negative infinity times infinity is negative infinity, and vice versa, infinity times a negative infinity is negative infinity. If you take infinity to a positive power, it will give you a positive infinity. And then the four division problems, which we're going to see in the next couple examples. If you take a very large positive number and you divide by a positive number, it will still be a very large positive number. So infinity divided by a is infinity. Negative infinity divided by a is negative infinity. If you take a real number a and you divide by a very large number, it's going to be very small. So a divided by infinity will be zero. And a divided by a very large negative number, well, a is a positive number. The denominator is going to be a negative large number. It's going to be really close to zero. All right, so since infinity is not a specific number on the real axis, the x-axis or the y-axis, some operations involving infinity are impossible to find out. For example, infinity subtract infinity, it's not always zero. In other words, infinity is representing a very large number. You don't know how large this number is, and you don't know how large this other number is that's represented by infinity. So if you subtract infinity, subtract infinity, it's not always zero. And infinity divided by infinity is not always one for the same reasons. You don't know how large this number that's represented by infinity is. So these two forms are called indeterminate forms, just like zero divided by zero was previously. So infinity, subtract infinity, indeterminate form. Infinity divided by infinity is also indeterminate form. So whenever you're evaluating limits that result in this special indeterminate form, infinity, subtract infinity, we're going to forcefully factor out the largest power of the variable that appears in the polynomial function. So let's look at example four, special limits. Find each of the following limits. So number one, the limit as x approaches infinity, so x is approaching a very large number for this polynomial, 75x to the third power, subtract 2x to the fourth power. So since this is a polynomial function, imagine that you're plugging in a very large number. 75 times the x is replaced with a very large number, as well as represented with infinity. It's being cubed. Subtract 2 times x is being replaced with a very large number that is being raised to the fourth power. We saw previously that if you take infinity raised to a power, you get infinity. So 75 times infinity. Subtract 2 times infinity to the fourth. Same reason, we subtract 2 times infinity. And then any number times infinity is positive infinity. And then 2 times infinity is still infinity. And this gives you an indeterminate form. So can we figure out this limit? We can, but we're just going to have to forcefully factor out the largest power of the variable. So let's retry this problem so that we don't get an indeterminate form this time. 
So the limit as x approaches infinity, same problem. 75x to the third, subtract 2x to the fourth is the polynomial. The largest power of x that you see is x to the fourth. So forcefully factor out x to the fourth. So factor out x to the fourth from both terms. You'll have 75 divided by x left over. Now notice that there's an x in the denominator so that when you distribute, if you distribute it back through, x to the fourth divided by x will give you the x cubed that you originally had. So 75 divided by x is left over. And then the same reason, if you take an x to the fourth out from 2x to the fourth, you'll have just 2 left. Okay, so let's now notice what we actually have done. If you substitute in infinity, and for these x's, you'll have infinity to the fourth, which is infinity. And then you have 75 divided by infinity. Well, 75 is a real number. Divided by infinity will be extremely small. It'll be practically zero. So 75 divided by infinity is zero. Subtract two. And so you'll have infinity times negative two, and infinity times a real number will be negative infinity. So in other words, the y values for this polynomial function are approaching negative infinity. So that means there's no horizontal asymptote for this polynomial function. Okay, number two. Let's try a different polynomial this time. The limit as x approaches negative infinity for the polynomial x to the fourth subtracts 7x squared plus 1. So again, let's see if we actually get an indeterminate form because we don't start factoring out the highest power of x unless we have an indeterminate form. So if you replace the x's with negative infinity this time, you'll have negative infinity to the fourth subtract 7 times negative infinity squared plus 1. Well, you'll have negative infinity to the fourth power. There's four negatives multiplied together, so that's positive. So you'll have positive infinity. Negative 7 times negative infinity squared is positive infinity, so negative 7 times infinity plus 1. Infinity minus 7 times infinity is infinity, so infinity subtract infinity plus 1. And so if you take infinity subtract infinity and you add 1 to it, it doesn't really change, so you get infinity subtract infinity, and that's an indeterminate form. So that means we're going to forcefully factor out the largest power of x that appears in the polynomial. So let's retry this problem. You have a limit as x approaches negative infinity of the original polynomial. The highest power of x that appears is x to the fourth. So factor out x to the fourth from all three terms in the polynomial. So you have limit as x approaches negative infinity of x to the fourth. You factor out x to the fourth from itself, you have one left over. Subtract seven. Now notice that if you're factoring out x to the fourth, you need an x squared in the denominator so that if you multiplied through the x to the fourth divided by x squared, we'll just give you x squared. And then the last term, if you factor out x to the fourth from one, you need x to the fourth in the denominator so that if you distributed x to the fourth divided by x to the fourth, we'll just give you one. So now drop the limit notation because we're going to plug in negative infinity. So negative infinity to the fourth times, in parentheses, one subtracts seven divided by negative infinity squared plus one divided by negative infinity to the fourth power. So on the outside, you have four negatives again. So you have infinity to the fourth, positive times, in parentheses, 1 subtract 7 divided by infinity squared plus 1 divided by infinity to the fourth. So in the previous problem, we found out that if you take infinity raised to any positive power, you're going to just get infinity. So infinity to the fourth is just infinity. Infinity squared is just infinity in the denominator. And then infinity to the fourth is also infinity. So infinity times, in parentheses, 1 subtract 7 divided by infinity plus 1 divided by infinity. And so now we can use the property involving a real number divided by infinity is really, really small. It's practically zero. So on the outside, you have an infinity times one subtract a real number divided by infinity is zero. And then one divided by infinity is also zero. So infinity times one, and that's just infinity. So again, you have no horizontal asymptote because the y values are approaching infinity for this polynomial function. All right, so since rational functions are actually the ratio of two different polynomial functions, we can use this idea that we had in the previous example to find out how to evaluate limits with rational functions that give you indeterminate forms where the numerator is plus or minus infinity and the denominator is also plus or minus infinity. So what we're going to do in the next example is to determine the limit of a rational function, we're going to forcefully factor out the largest exponent or the largest power of the variable that appears in the denominator. So we're going to factor out the largest power that appears in the denominator from both the polynomial in the numerator and the polynomial that appears in the denominator. So example five, special limits. Find each of the following limits. So each of these next two problems will involve rational functions, and we're letting x approach infinity or negative infinity. 
Well, in the previous video, we talked about how to find horizontal asymptotes when x is approaching infinity or negative infinity with rational functions by comparing the degrees. Well, what we're going to talk about in example five is how do you find out what the horizontal asymptote is? How do you evaluate these, these limits at infinity using an algebraic approach? So number one, the limit as x approaches negative infinity for this function, 25 subtract x squared in the numerator, x to the fourth subtract 7x in the denominator. So to figure out how to evaluate this limit, let's see if we actually do get an indeterminate form first. So substitute in negative infinity for all the x values in the numerator and denominator. You'll have 25 subtract negative infinity squared divided by negative infinity to the fourth, subtract seven times negative infinity. And if you simplify this, you'll have negative infinity in the numerator and you'll have positive infinity in the denominator. So this is a variation of an indeterminate form. You have negative infinity in the numerator and you have a very large number, infinity, in the denominator. So now we're going to repeat what we just did in example four, except we're going to forcefully factor out the largest power that appears in the denominator from the polynomial that's in the numerator and denominator. Okay, so let's start this problem over. You have the limit as x approaches negative infinity for the original function, this rational function. The largest power that appears in the denominator is x to the fourth. So forcefully factor out x to the fourth from the numerator and factor out x to the fourth from the denominator. So when you do this, you'll have x to the fourth, factor out, you'll have 25 divided by x to the fourth, subtract x squared divided by x to the fourth in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you'll have x to the fourth factor out, you'll have one left over from the first term and subtract seven divided by x cubed in the denominator. That way, again, if you distribute the x to the fourth with that second term, the x to the fourth divided by x cubed will just give you x left over. So now why do we do this? The x to the fourth that we factor out from the numerator will cancel out with the x to the fourth that we factor out from the denominator. And so now we all only have left is either constant terms or rational functions where there's a power of x in the denominator. So limit as x approaches negative infinity of 25 divided by x to the fourth, subtract one divided by x squared after you simplify, one subtract seven x cubed in the denominator. So now let's see what happens if you substitute in negative infinity. You have 25 divided by negative infinity to the fourth after you replace the x, subtract one divided by negative infinity squared, all divided by one subtract seven divided by negative infinity cubed, so notice that we dropped the limit notation because we plugged in negative infinity for all the x's. So negative infinity to the fourth is positive infinity to the fourth, and negative infinity squared is positive infinity squared. And same thing with negative infinity cubed, you'll have negative infinity. And so after you simplify, you'll have 25 divided by infinity. That's 25 is a real number divided by a very large number, that's zero. One divided by infinity, again, that's zero. 1 is just 1, and then 7 divided by infinity is 0, because you're taking a real number and dividing by a very large number, it's going to be practically 0. And then you get 0 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator, and 0 divided by 1 is 0. So that means you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which is the x-axis. How can we know that the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0? Well, we can go back to the previous video and talk about the degrees of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. The degree of the numerator is 2, and the degree of the denominator is 4, and we're letting x approach infinity or x approaches negative infinity. So if the power in the denominator is larger than the power that appears in the numerator, the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis, or y equals 0. All right, number 2. Let's look at the limit as x approaches positive infinity for 3x squared subtract 11 divided by 4x squared plus 5x minus 1. Well, from the previous video, we know that the answer will be since the degree of the numerator is 2 and the degree of the denominator is 2, it will be the, the horizontal asymptote will be the fraction or the ratio of the leading coefficients. So the leading coefficient of the numerator is 3 and 4 is the leading coefficient of the denominator. And so the equation y equals 3 fourths will be the horizontal asymptote. Now let's show this using an algebraic method. So let's see what happens if you substitute in infinity for all the x's in the numerator and denominator. You'll have 3 times infinity squared, subtract 11, divided by 4 times infinity squared, plus 5 times infinity, subtract 1. And if you simplify the numerator and denominator, you'll come up with infinity divided by infinity. That's an indeterminate form of type infinity divided by infinity. So that means 
that we have an algebraic method to find out the horizontal asymptote. We're going to forcefully factor out the largest power that appears in the denominator from both the polynomial in the numerator and the polynomial that appears in the denominator. So let's start the problem over. The limit as x approaches infinity of the original rational function factor out x squared from the numerator and denominator because that's the highest power that appears in the denominator. So you, when you do that, you'll have x squared times there's a 3 left over minus 11 divided by x squared. That way when you multiply x squared times the second term, the x squares will cancel out and you'll just be left with 11. And now do the same thing in the denominator. Factor out x squared. You'll have a 4 left over, a 5 divided by x, and a 1 divided by x squared. And the reason why we're doing this is because the x squared from the numerator will cancel out with the x squared that we factor out from the denominator. And so what's left over will either be constant terms or you'll have fractions where you have x to a positive power in the denominator. So what's left over is the limit as x approaches infinity. 3 subtract 11 over x squared. And then in the denominator you have 4 plus 5 divided by x subtract 1 divided by x squared. So now plug in infinity, because that's what we're approaching, for all the x's. So you'll have 3 subtract 11 divided by infinity squared. 4 plus 5 divided by infinity, and subtract 1 divided by infinity squared. So notice that the limit notation is dropped because we plugged in infinity for all the x's. And so after you simplify, you'll have 3 subtract 11 divided by infinity. So that's 3 subtract 0 in the numerator. And in the denominator, you have 4 plus 5 divided by infinity, that's 0, minus 1 divided by infinity, that's 0. So you have 4 plus 0 minus 0, and you do get 3 fourths which is exactly what we said the horizontal asymptote would be. The horizontal asymptote will be the equation y equals 3 fourths, the ratio of the leading coefficients. But this is the algebraic way to show that the horizontal asymptote is y equals 3 fourths. Okay, so let's finish up this video talking about a couple applications where rational functions come in. So example six, the concentration of sugar in a tank. Suppose that you have a large mixing tank that currently contains 100 gallons of water, where there's five pounds of water, that have been mixed. An open tap pours 10 gallons of water per minute into the tank at the same time sugar is poured into the tank at a rate of one pound per minute. So part one, find the concentration, which is given in pounds per gallon of sugar in the tank after t minutes. So in other words, we're gonna come up with a function that describes the concentration of the sugar in the water where the variable is t. So notice in the problem that the concentration is given as a ratio. It's pounds per gallon. So it's pounds of sugar, per is the fraction bar, and then you have gallons of water. So we're going to come up with a rational function that describes the concentration. So C of T is representing the concentration, and it's going to be a rational function. Notice that we started off with five pounds of sugar, and we are adding one pound of sugar per minute. So every minute that passes, we're adding in one pound of sugar. So in the numerator, you start off with 5, and for every minute that passes, you're adding in 1t in the numerator for the pounds of sugar. In the denominator, you have gallons of water. Originally, there was 100 gallons of water in the tank, so we start off with 100 gallons of water, and it says that there's an open tap that pours in 10 gallons of water every minute. So every minute, you're going to add in 10 more gallons. So 100 gallons to start off with, so every unit that T increases, we add in 10 gallons of water. So notice that this is going to be a rational function. You have 5 plus T in the numerator. That's a polynomial function. And in the denominator, you have 100 plus 10T. That's also a polynomial function. So this represents the concentration of the sugar in the tank after T minutes. Okay, number two. Find the horizontal asymptote of the concentration function C if it exists and interpret what the horizontal asymptote represents in this scenario. So we know that if we want to find out the horizontal asymptote, we're looking at an, a limit at infinity. So we're going to let time approach infinity. It's going to continue indefinitely. So limit as time approaches infinity for our concentration of the sugar in the water. So replace the concentration function, which is a rational function. So limit as t approaches infinity for our function that we found out in the previous part. 5 plus t divided by 100 plus 10t. Now again, we can use the shortcut this time. We can have the degree of the numerator is 1, and the degree of the denominator is 1. So we know that the horizontal asymptote will occur, or the value of this limit will be the ratio of the leading coefficients, 
which is 1 in the numerator, and a leading coefficient in the denominator is 10. So this limit is going to approach 1 tenth. So that means the horizontal asymptote, to answer the question, the horizontal asymptote will be at y equals 1 tenth. And so to interpret what this means in the context of the problem, we're letting t approach infinity. So we're letting time continue indefinitely. We know that we found out the limit of the concentration, and the concentration will approach 1 tenth. So the concentration of the sugar in the tank approaches 1 tenth, or 0 0.1, and we know that the concentration is measured in pounds of sugar per gallon. All right, one more problem. So example seven, average cost function. So this might be something that you've seen in college algebra. Suppose that a family plans on renting a U-Haul that has a nine foot long cargo van. The renting cost is $19.95 to rent the U-Haul and is 59 cents per mile that you drive the U-Haul. Part one, what is the fixed daily cost and what's the cost per mile? The fixed daily cost is the renting cost. So it takes $19.95 to rent the U-Haul, so that's the fixed cost each day, and the cost per mile is $0.59 cents per mile that you drive the U-Haul. And so this is what's called the variable cost because we know that this is a rate of change. It's $0.59 cents per mile, so every mile that we drive, we have to pay an additional $0.59. Cents. So part two, write an equation that gives you the daily cost function, which is C of X, where X is the number of miles that you drive. So the cost function is made up of two different parts. The cost function, there's a fixed cost of renting the U-Haul, and there's also a variable cost of how much do you actually pay for driving the U-Haul X miles. So the cost function is C of X, $19.95. There's no variable attached to this because it's not a variable cost. It's the fixed cost, so it's a constant, plus 0.59X, and that's the cost per mile. So we know that as we drive the U-Haul X miles, we'll have a variable cost 0.59X. And so notice that this cost function is a linear function. $19.95 plus 59 cents times X. That gives you the cost. Okay, number three. Going back to the original statement of the problem, we want to find out the average cost function. So the average daily cost per mile is given by a ratio between the cost function and the number of miles driven. So that means, in other words, the average cost function, and we're going to see this type of function come up later in the course, the average cost is represented as AC of X, or you might have seen in college algebra that it's represented as a C with a bar over it, meaning average. So the average cost of X, it's represented as a ratio, so a rational function. Cost function is in the numerator, and it's a ratio with the number of miles driven, and that was X. So the average cost function is C of X divided by X. So in part three, it's asking us to find what's the average daily cost function C bar of X. So take the answer that we came up with in part two for the daily cost function and divide by X. So the average daily cost function will be AC of X or C bar of X, which is cost function divided by X. So $19.95 plus 59 cents times X and take that entire numerator and divide by x. And that's what's called the average cost function. And so now that the average cost function we know is a rational function, part four, what does the average daily cost per mile tend to as the driving distance increases? So imagine that you have this U-Haul and you drive the U-Haul indefinitely. What does the average cost per day come out to be? So we know that we want to find a horizontal asymptote. We want to find out what does the graph y values actually approach as the number of miles distance increases indefinitely. So limit as x approaches infinity of the average cost function, because we want to find out the average cost per mile as x increases. It's the limit as x approaches infinity of c bar of x, or the limit as x approaches infinity of the answer we came up with in part three, $19.95 plus 59 cents times x, all divided by x. Now again, Notice that this is a rational function. We're letting x approach infinity, so it's a limit at infinity. We can use the shortcut. Notice that the degree of the numerator is one. The degree of the denominator is one. The numerator and denominator are polynomials. So the leading coefficient of the numerator is 0.59. The leading coefficient of the denominator is one. And so 0.59 divided by one gives you 59 cents per mile. The numerator is cost, so that's in dollars. The denominator is miles, so this gives you 59 cents per mile. 
So as the number of miles driven increases indefinitely, the average cost will approach 59 cents per mile. So this finishes our video on limits involving infinity and application problems involving rational functions. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about any of the problems in the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about continuity of functions.